Amen. Amen. If y'all want to open your Bible to James chapter 1, and that's going to be not just a little different, but very different than what we normally do. We're in a short series, um, God, Marriage, and Family. It's typically we just go through books of the Bible, but we've taken, taken a little time to, to do this. Thank you. Uh, to do God, Marriage, and Family. And so the last couple weeks we talked about parenting. And in keeping with that, uh, this morning, and this, this has been kicked around for a little while by, by Theron and I and, and when and, and how to do this, and so we just let's, let's just do it, you know. And so we want to talk to you this morning about fostering for the glory of God. I really got three sort of objectives here that we might do. One is to just raise, raise some awareness about what fostering is. Um, secondly, to potentially generate some interest in being a part of a ministry like this in some different capacity. And then really in, in seeing God's heart uh, for fostering, th- those three things. So kind of aiming for that. And, and um, we've, got, we've got five reasons to foster and seven ways to help. And I'm going to get to those here in, in just a minute. So we'll, so we'll try to get going here. But um, foster care is a system, this is my, not my definition, the d- definition I found. It said foster care is a system run by the government where minors are put into the custody of the state and placed with foster parents to care for their daily needs. There are, and this is, we'll get more specific on these statistics later, but nationwide there's 415,000 children in foster care, each thing in foster care an average of about a year. So that's, um, that's, a definition that you can use, but I want to I want to broaden that a little bit, and I want to because I've talked to so many people that are involved in in fostering, and they just don't name it that. In in this uh, a, this kind of a, a big umbrella, and I think many of you might say, "Oh yeah, well that's something that that I'm a part of in some capacity." And so this is a definition that I've, I've come up with: fostering is loving, nurturing, and helping raise kids that you don't have to for the glory of God and their good. Fostering is nurturing and helping to raise kids that you don't have to for the glory of God and their good. So I have with me this morning one of our elders, Theron Whitley, and a fellow foster parent. I'm going to ask Theron, you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and then how you guys got into fostering. Yeah, good morning, church family. Uh, once again, my name is Theron Whitley, uh, elder here. I've been, my wife and I and kids have been coming here about 15 years. In 2019, um, I'm a, I'm a fireman uh, by, by trade, uh, so I, I've dealt with like kids that have been neglected, parents have been incarcerated, uh, and so I've kind of seen that that side of it. And in reality, I've had a really kind of shaded view of DFPS or, or known as Child Protective Services in the past. In 2019, I really felt like God I'm laying on my heart of like these kids are in need, right, of a, of a family. Like, what does a family look like? And so I was praying over that, and then I. Uh, I went, I went to my wife and said, hey, uh, what do you think about, about fostering? And she said that she'd been praying over that for a couple of years, uh, probably knew that I was, wouldn't be interested in it. Uh, and then in 2019, like, it was like almost an affirmation from the Lord saying that both of us were going to be on board with this. And so back then I went to a symposium up at uh, First United in Sherman, and all the, at the time the judges uh, were there for this symposium talking about what, what is foster care, what does it look like. Uh, and so basically foster care is when a child is removed for imminent danger, whether that be for, for neglect, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, or, or some type of physical need where the parents aren't providing that care, they get removed. Uh, and then from investigations, and then they're put into a home if there's no other family members or friends that can take the child. Uh, so they can, kind of gave information about it at that time. Uh, Covenant Kids was one of the agencies that was there, uh, and they had several other agencies. Uh, and so Janet and I had the opportunity to kind of look through those agencies, pray about it, what agency, <clears throat> excuse me, what agency we wanted to use to get our license from. And so pre-service was uh, several uh, nights uh, in Plano and in Arlington for training uh, to how to become a, a better parent, but ultimately a better foster parent. And so one of the interesting facts that I thought about that was, or that I was taught about that is, a child in utero, and there's domestic violence, drug use, you're, that, that child's having effects uh, developmentally and on the brain itself. The interesting thing is that a child can be rewired by love and affection. Uh, and so that's the cool thing about foster care is, like, you can actually, when you love on these kids like they're your own, you're helping them developmentally and, and mentally and spiritually, right? And so... <clears throat> 
in the, in the early 80s and 90s, we kind of defined these kids that are put in to the system as, as foster kids. And that's one of the big things uh, that, that we've pushed recently is they're not, their definition isn't a foster kid. They're, they're a child, right? And so uh, I've had several people ask Jen and I, like, man, it must be hard to, to send them off because uh, I would just fall in love with them. Well, we love these kids like they're our own, right? Uh, and that's the biggest deal about this is, yeah, that's, that's what foster kids, agencies want they want parents out there and they want the support system out there to love them like they're their own because that's that's what the kid needs right they didn't deserve this i want to i want to interject this because i didn't in the first service and you addressed that very well earlier i think that's the biggest question that we get about fostering is uh we we get you know like you said i don't think obviously people aren't thinking about it like i couldn't do that because i would just love them too much like well i guess you're saying we don't love kids i, don't, I mean I, what, what we really do like you know and there's not we love them very much um but you have to just, you, there is no guard your heart. There's none of that that goes on. You just love the kid, love the children as your own, treat them like they're your own. And then I view this, and I have to take this view on so many things. Um, it started with student ministry, a reference toward Q right there. It started in student ministry um, when I realized these kids graduate. So this is ascending ministry. I didn't, I didn't like the fact that I had these kids, you just give your whole heart to these kids in student ministry, and then they graduate, and they're off to tech, or they're off to AM or they're off wherever they go, and then I'm like, well, that's it, and then they, very time, many times they don't settle back, and you don't, you don't see them again, you don't get bits around them again. It doesn't mean you stop doing it. It doesn't mean you didn't love them. Um, so it is a sending ministry, and then parents who are sitting here, how old was Caden when y'all started fostering? That would have been 2019. What grade was he in? Uh, so he, he'd be uh, he's probably a freshman. Okay, so he, he was a freshman in high school. 2019, I had, uh, we started the same, yeah. we're on the same trajectory, the same timing. I already had a son that was out of the house, and then uh, Trinity was knocking on the door. My olders were um, either out of the house or, or knocking on the door, and so I'd already experienced that. And I'm just, I mean, I'm not trying to make everybody get teary-eyed, but every parenting is a sending ministry. Every parenting is a sending ministry. You cannot hold them forever. Now, that does not mean that it's easy or any of those kinds of things, but there's a way to kind of think about it. Does that make sense? You don't guard your heart. You don't hold back. You just love them like they're your own. And that part is, is very, very hard. But keep going. Yeah, so uh, we, we threw that statistic out of 415,000 uh, children in foster care. That's nationwide. There's roughly 30,000 kids currently in the state of Texas that are in foster care. Out of that 30,000 kids, 45% of them will maybe go back to their biological family member. So that's the goal of foster care. The primary goal is reunification, uh, to be reunited with a family member. Now, that may not be mom or dad, maybe grandma, grandpa, cousin, aunt, something like that. But the study shows that the uh, kid thrives when they're back to a biological family member. But up to that year that we have them, 18 months, two years that we have them, uh, we, we get to love on them. Uh, they see their parents hopefully once a week uh, if parents choose to follow the, uh, the program that's laid before them with that but we also need a support network right it, it takes a village to raise our bio kids uh so we have we have four bio kids ourselves, uh and then we've had 13 in our home right but those are our kids so uh the thing about the state of texas now is we realize that we don't want to label these kids as foster kids so if you have questions about well i have a trampoline so i can't have foster kids well that that's false you can't have a trampoline you just got to make some netting around it and make it safe uh the state don't want to lose a kid to an injury because we were just doing some bad parenting, I guess, uh, over that. So that's the biggest deal. Uh, but this today is if, if you don't have a home open for foster care, that doesn't mean that you uh, zoom out of this because there's other ways to help, and we'll talk about that. Yep, absolutely. Um, so let me get into these five, five reasons to foster. And, again, like you said, one of these things is to broaden out the understanding of fostering beyond just the formal understanding of what when – we, when we say fostering, we're typically talking about the formal, you know, in, enrolled in the – of training and get licensed by the state and all that kind of stuff but again a lot more ways to help first reason to foster is a biblical one so i've got you in james and if you want to look at james 127 or 126 right before that it says if anyone thinks he's religious i probably need to say this there's been a lot of viral videos about religion is bad but the gospel is good they kind of pin those things against each other what we need to understand is that there's good and bad religion so if you read your bible it'll talk about religion in a favorable way like it does now so Check your YouTube with your Bible, okay? So here, it says, uh, if anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but this, it deceives his heart, this, person religious is, this person's religion is worthless. So that's a bad form of religion. Here's a good form of religion. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So here's a Christian principle that you find there 
in verse 27. And it's to help the helpless, orphans, widows, people that you take care of, that the assumption is they cannot pay you back. You're just giving to them. And fostering definitely follows, uh, follows, falls in this category. There's no one that is more helpless than a child. When you've seen a, 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 a four-month-old baby show up at your house to get transported there by uh, CPS, and they show up in a car seat in clothes that were more fit for November, and it's July, and, uh, you know, they got, a, they got a little trash bag of some stuff. That kid is in desperate need of help, and it is biblical for us to care specifically for widows, yes, but specifically also for the, those that are orphaned without parents in, uh, among us. This is one that's a little bit more. If y'all want to turn to Job, just so you can say you went to Job at some point in your life. Everybody kind of kind of avoids Job, and I get it. Job's a, known as the book on suffering. But in Job 29, there's this very cool reference, and I'm not sure I would have picked up on this if it had not been for going through fostering. But in Job 29, Job is kind of given this inventory of his life and saying, why is this happening to me? And he's saying some things about himself. And I've looked, there's lots of good stuff here. But I've looked at that and thought, man, I want to be able to say this. I want to be able to, to inventory my life and go, I'm, I'm being faithful in this area. I'm being faithful in this area. I'm being faithful. And Job was a dude, man. Like he was, you know, sought justice for people, all that kind of stuff. But Job 29, 16, he says of himself in just truthful fashion, I was a father to the needy. And I searched out the cause of whom I did not know. A father to the needy. That's what fostering is. And we're going to work on that working understanding of being a father of the needy. does not always include getting a license, but it can. And then he said, I searched out the cause of him I did not know. Our, the world's mentality is, if it ain't in my backyard, it ain't really happening. If it's, not, if it's not on my personal radar, that's the way that the world thinks. Um, and if it does, I may or may not help with it. But what Job said, and a Christian perspective on it is, I'm looking for ways to help. I'm seeking out the cause of him who I didn't even know. If I can help, I want to help. Now, where does all this, this come from? It's, and I'm going to get to this more on this in a second, but that's what Jesus did for us. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. Remember that old hymn? He sought me out. Remember the, the parable of the, of the prodigal son? The father's looking down the road for that, that rebellious kiddo. And so I didn't deserve what, what God the Father has done for me, there's no way that a kid can earn the, the favor that we're going to give to them. They don't have the capacity to do so. They can't pay us back. We're seeking out the cause of them we did not know. And then, Theron, you had um, Matthew 25. You brought this reference up. Truly I say to you, um, as, you did it to the, as you did to the one of the, the least of these, my brothers, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So why would you pick that verse, Matthew 25 and uh, yeah. yeah, if you go a little bit before that, it talks about when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, right? And, and this is something that we don't even know that we're, we're serving necessarily Christ at the time in that context there. Uh, this is what the kids need. They, need. they need love, right? I mean, it's easy to give someone clothes, right? And we can pat ourselves on the back on that. But to, to truly love someone, to deny yourself, uh, you know, of what you want, and just spend quality time with someone, uh, that, that's what that meant to me is uh, to the least of these, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're hopeless, but we can give them hope in Christ. Um, and it's easy for us as foster parents and as people looking from the outside in the system itself, it's like, well, these are bad parents, right? Foster care gives you an opportunity to witness to the parents themselves as well. Uh, one of the, the and I true, truly do believe this, uh, it's an epidemic in, in the United States is we don't have men stepping up being fathers. And, and most of the fathers are not uh, present in the, in the CPS system in itself, right? So men out here, y'all have an opportunity to, uh, to, be what, to show kids, teenagers, adolescents, uh, what, what does a godly man look like? And, and that, that's getting on and potentially just playing with them, right? Uh, changing, changing that kid's diaper. I mean, I'm, I'm 43. Like, I don't think I wanted to have a, a newborn, but we have newborns in our home, right? And, and, I don't ideally like changing diapers. That's kind of weird to me. Not on the list, uh, yeah. uh, but ideally, and, and realistically, and, and we'll get into religion in a few minutes uh, of it, is oh, it's, we're to deny ourselves. Uh, and sometimes that's, and I have to remind myself of that, especially when I work at the fire station and I come home and there's a three-month-old that cries all night long of I have to deny the sleep that I want or deny of like I want a fresh air and not a poopy diaper, right? Amen. Uh, Amen, so. brother. 
And programming, is, programming self-denial into our life is a really good thing. We have, we're we're a, a people that values comfort very, very highly, and we'll arrange our life to where everything is comfortable for us. And having programmed into your life something that makes you deny yourself is a very good thing, which I, I labored over whether or not I should couple these t- together. But I said a, a biblical reason, but also a theological reason to, to foster. That would be the second thing, a theological reason. So what we, what we do in, in, in other ways, too, like, but one of, in, in fostering, it's a reenactment of what God has done for us. It's nothing that, it's nothing we, and there is, there is a sweetness to serving in such a way that you don't get anything in, in return. It really is. Like, you feel that, you, as a Christian, you know that, and you feel that, and, um, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, for lack of a better term, it's, it's intoxicating. You know, to just to be right in the middle. Like, you, I can look at my life many times and go, I don't know if that's helpful. I don't know if that's helpful. But I've never had a question about whether or not fostering children is helpful. Um, my, to, to Darren's point about partnering with the, the parents who've had kids removed, that's a very, very, very good point. My wife, Casey, will is immediately when the kids start um, going to visits with their parents, she makes a journal and writes letters to the moms because she's a mom and she knows what a mom would want to know. So she writes everything she can down about that baby and tells everything that he or she's been doing and makes sure that mama stays informed. And so we're bringing, um, we're, we're humanizing him or her. We're not just talking about the old, those sorry suckers that, you know, alienating people for what they have done is not the, is, it doesn't further the gospel. And it's a very disarming thing for her to reach out to these people that way she could look at them and be like, I shouldn't even have to be doing this, but it's her privilege to get to do this. And so she reaches out to them. And I've watched these, these mothers um, who are very hard to most people and honestly pretty hard to the men in their life because they haven't known one that hasn't hit them or something like that. But I've watched them become very disarmed to her and say, I'll listen to whatever that lady has to say. And what she has to say is the gospel good news of Jesus Christ. And we have foster children returned them. They've been reunified, as Theron said the goal is, to be reunified with Mama and we're still friends with Mama. And our grace group was able to do some things for Mama after Baby went back. And we're um, friends with, I know this is kind of weird, but I'm old enough now that I'm friends with the Mama's Mama because the grandma's about my age, okay? And so we're friends on Facebook, and, and I keep up and all those kinds of things. And we get, we get to have a gospel presence in, in, in their life. A uh, uh, biblical reason theological reason, it's a gospel reenactment for everything you do, a great need. Talk a little bit about the need for foster care parents. Yeah, so once again, there's 30,000 uh, kids in foster care, right? And out of that, roughly, you know, less than 15% or 15,000 will go back to their homes, right? We're second in the nation behind California, Texas is, for the number of foster care kids. And I mean, we're big, so that makes sense. But. We're we're a big state. Uh, there's been there's been some changes in, in DFPS, uh recently and so if you if you're considered doing foster care you're like well the number's going down like we're not removing as many kids you're right we're not removing as, as many kids uh that's not because they don't need to be removed there's no homes available so we're 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 allowing more things to happen to the kids before we say okay now we got to remove them like they nearly the the definition the neglect would be um to to the point of life threatening before we'd remove a child so right. they've had to loosen the parameters on what is uh, permissive parenting based on the fact that there aren't foster care parents available. It's just That's a reality that's happened. They had to make it illegal for the foster care, uh, the um, CPS workers, to host the kids in the office because they were spending the night in the office because they had nowhere to put the kids. Well, then they start putting them into hotel rooms. They made it illegal to put them in the office, so i got to put them in hotel rooms. What do you all think hotel rooms cost? Money. What do you think it all comes down to? Money. So now that it's costing the state money to put them in hotel rooms, now what are we going to do? Well, we're going to make it easier for you to keep your kids even though you may be neglecting them. By the definition that was used last year, we're going to change that definition this year. Yeah, and so the and the other thing with that is, like, so you have this CPS worker, DFPS worker that's worked 12 hours shift, 14 hour shift, 16 hour shift. And now she has to catch an overtime, like mandatory shift at the hotel room. Do you think she really wants to spend time with that kid? Probably not. Cause she's burned out. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so that's another need of why we need loving homes uh, for, for, for these kids. And so uh, if you, if you want to say, well, y'all have four kids, how many kids can you have? Legally, I can have six kids in my home, including my bio kids. So that gives me an opportunity to serve two kids at the time. What's happening right now is uh, kids are getting separated uh, because we don't want large, uh, large numbers. 
denying herself here, right? So take take a little little bit of consideration about taking a, a, a sibling group in. Otherwise, those kids are getting separated. Uh, and so there may be two foster homes or they're going to a group home. I would love to see Christians specifically step up in this regard. Um, we have, uh, I, our church holds a biblical view of marriage, that marriage is a way of life given by God to one man and one woman committed together for life. Um, I believe in, and I grew up in, in single parent homes, and, and, and I'm okay, I get that. But when I read the Bible, I believe the best case scenario for children, and statistics back me up on this, by the way, is a mom and a dad in a home. If people don't step up, there is now a, a large group of people who are from uh, uh, who don't believe in biblical marriage, who don't who don't practice what we would call traditional marriage, or I might say biblical marriage, that a, a, a man and a man together, a woman and a woman together, they can't have children. So guess who steps up to be foster parents? They're they're raring to go. They say Let, send them our way. We would love to have kids, and then we don't have we don't have our family stepping up in that regard. And so y'all get y'all see how that works out that. Uh, we may have a whole generation of kids that are raised in, in homes that aren't, being, aren't practicing uh, biblical marriage. I hope that's not a shock to y'all that we hold that belief, but that's something that informs me really often. If I say no, who am I saying yes to? I'm not, I mean, those are just the things that go on in, in my head. Point being, there is a great need. There is a great need, and there's a great need all around you, and I promise we're going to take some of the the weighty sort of guilt out of the room in just a minute for some of this and let you know that there, you may not need to change anything about what you're doing to be a part of what God has called you to do. Um, so, but we said it's a great need. The fourth thing, it's a great family ministry. A lot of times us as Christians, we're looking for what stuff can we do together? So Theron, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, I think this is missional living. It's a, it's a true mission uh, for, for a Christ-centered home. Uh, so we got into foster care late, later in raising our children, right? And so... Uh, they've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of parenting by itself. You know, uh, they can see life choices uh, with that. Uh, you know, my my oldest daughter, she's going to wind up uh, probably being a CPS investigator to try to eliminate some of the the struggles that these kids are having. Uh, my youngest daughter says that you know we were all orphans at, at one point uh, until we found a, a heavenly father, and so she sees it that way. And the choices that that you make as a as a young person can affect you long long term. Um, you know, Caden, my, my oldest son, you know, he was busy playing football and everything else, but he, he saw it as those are his brothers and sisters. Uh, and he loved them like that. And same thing with Jackson. Uh, and so it's hard, like, uh, and I'm not looking for sympathy. It's hard to say goodbye. Right. But our, our ministry is not adoption, like for the Whitley household. It's, it's to bridge the gap until mom and dad can get reunified or they can find a permanent home. Um, but it also gives a, a ministry to, to not only serve the foster kid, the children that come in our home, but their parents, and the people that come into our home. Uh, so when you when you get into foster care through through the state, you have a, a, a uh, an investigator first, and then you go to a court hearing to make sure that we didn't take a kid out of a home illegally. So the judge said, "Hey, I agree with this uh, removal." And then from there, they, they're assigned a caseworker. Uh, and, it's, and now in the state of Texas, in this region, it's a third-party company called Empower. Well, they, the last caseworker, we had 28 kids underneath her, her leadership, right? Uh, she's burned out. Uh, most of the time, she's talking to parents that are uh, pretty mad at her because she's going to make a de uh, decision on whether they can go back to mom or dad or not. She needs ministry herself. She needs an outlet. So it gives us an opportunity to, for our kids, for, for Jana and I, to just talk to somebody that's doing what's in the best interest of, of them, right? One of our CPS work, or not uh, our uh, case workers, uh, she was like, she came to her house, she's like 24. We're like super old parents, you know. So she's like a 24-year-old girl in there telling us how to, how to parent, you know, which is kind of weird. It's, it's humbling or whatever. But then next thing you know, she's sitting crisscross applesauce on the couch and playing with her hair and telling us about her boyfriend. And I'm like, this just turned into a, like a youth group counseling session. But I'm so thankful for the opportunity to, to get to do that. It, and and our, our, our families, is Jaylee a senior this year? Yes. So for a senior in high school to be able to say, theologically state, we're all orphaned. God saved all, that is, I'm not saying Theron and Jana couldn't have taught that themselves to her, but for her to be able to pick that up, that gospel thing, it's, it's gospel ministry working in and through and ministering to our kids. We worry so much about our kids not having enough, and our kids have a surplus of so many things, and one of the best things we can afford them is opportunities to 
deny themselves. And Theron said in his first service, it's not like we're just pawning the kids off on our kids. My kids might disagree a little bit because there are sometimes when it's just like our hands are full and they show up. They're always willing to help. It's now in, in their minds. That's just the way they think. I asked them uh, a couple things like Theron did for, for his kiddos. And I said, you'll put in our family group text. I said, how fostering changed you? Change the way you view things. And Q said, uh, the world's perceived inconvenience, he has in quotes, is the greatest joy. So, like, don't let me and Theron sit up here and act like, oh, this, you, need, you need to give us sympathy. Like you said a while ago, you need to feel something. This is the greatest joy. And it, what, what looks like an inconvenience, y'all have experienced this if you've served in the capacities you, that you have, man. You get in there and you're like, I tried to bless somebody and ended up getting blessed. Same thing. On a, but sometimes on a grander scale that you get to experience that joy. So I thought that was good from Q. Um, my son-in-law, Levi. So poor Levi married into this family, you know. And, um, but he, he said this. He says, it has shown me that God honors the decision to die to yourself in order to take care of others and given me a desire to look outside of myself in a way that I wouldn't have before. Oh, man, that, that, that touched my heart. I don't know how in the world I would have ever imparted that to him, but to know that he picked that up from, from the family part of the ministry. Trinity said this. She's a little like her dad, kind of wordy, so y'all buckle up. Here she says this. <laughs> Being a fostering family has given me perspective on how much of a need there is for so many kids. This creates a need for families that are willing, to, uh, willing and able to foster, but more importantly, families that love God and care about the souls of the kids they are taking care of. Depending on the situation, there might, there might be only so much that you can do for their circumstances, but you, can, uh, but you can love them in a way that plants seeds of eternity in their heart, and that's what we're here to do. Fostering is being on mission in your own home and doing exactly what God would have us to do as his, as his children, taking care of orphans and widows, and then she referenced uh, James 1.27. Darren, you and I talked early on about how it was like all the trips that we take to New Mexico, it's like we brought them home. You just kind of have that sense. That's at the peak. Now, don't get me wrong. Things are hard, but you get a sense of that many times. Yeah, I think uh, I think our kids see contentment, right? It's easy in the world, and, and especially out like in the North Texas area, we always want more, 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 more. Uh, the thing about this ministry here is we have to all be on board with it, right? And so we have a we have a a, a child that comes to our home, and they're there for twelve months, eighteen months, whatever. Uh, we t- we we can either take a break, right? or we get back on the list, the openings list, right? Well, we all have to agree on it. So, uh, you know, currently there's five that live in the house, and so we, all five of us need to say, hey, we're good for another placement. And if one of them says no, one of us says no, then, then we're going to wait because it, it is a family ministry, and it's taxing. You know, they're, they're denying some of their stuff that they want, uh, and, and that's okay. Like, we're not looking for sympathy on this at all, uh, but they, they chose to do the ministry with us as well. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to share something Casey said, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, tell you all something so you all can see how selfish I am sometimes. We were on the list for a long time to, to take a child, and we, nothing was coming. No, no calls were coming in or anything, and we're like, what's going on? Well, we kept getting closer and closer to this beach vacation, and I was like, oh, crud, because you can't, like, take a kid in and then leave that day, you know. Hey, thanks for the kid. We're going to Pensacola. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, you can take them on vacation, but there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done leading up to that. And so selfishly, I just started praying that maybe we'd get the vacation in. Before anybody called, I'm just, that's just a confession. That's what happened. And then after the fact, Casey was like, you didn't do that. I was like, oh, yeah, I did. Like, I mean, the, I mean, babe, the condo was booked. I mean, what are we doing here? Listen, y'all, we got to the vacation, went on the vacation. We got home from the vacation. I mean, I, y'all, been, y'all been to the beach. Everything on you is dirty. There is sand everywhere. You're completely out of sorts. And the phone rings. And it was a, it was a baby headed our way. And uh, we... We, uh, Nora and I, jumped through everything we had. Remember my headlights went out on the Yoda, that, which doesn't even happen with the t- Tacoma, my gosh. So we had, like, we had to jump through our rears to go get everything that we needed that night, and she's on her way, and the car's still, the, you know, the car's still packed from the beach. And it was, it was watching our family go into action in, in, in like at what would have been the most, you know, seemingly the most inconvenient of times. But, hey, God answered the prayer and said, now, big boy, it's time to get to work. It's time to get to work. God has a, a sense of humor in that way. Casey said this about how it's changed her. She says, it's shown me that I can do hard things. When he calls us to something, he really does equip us to go through it. 
does not make it easy, but it does give us a, a, a drive in our spirit to say we are going to answer the calling regardless of the outcome. And I know that comes from a mama's heart. We're, we're pretty beat up right now. Theron and I talked about this. It's even good timing to do this because it's been a, it's been a tough season of, of fostering. We've had we've had um, uh, easier times, and this is not one of them. I know it comes from a mama's heart that is that is genuine. Um, it really speaks to the fifth thing, which is um, fostering. One of the reasons fostering it is a way to get closer to Jesus. Christians ought to ask this about everything we're doing. Like, what are, what am, why should I do? If I do this, will it draw me closer to Jesus, or is it going to distance me from Him? This will definitely draw you closer to Jesus. Uh, to be dependent upon Him. Um, I don't know, if Theron. What do you tell, tell me? Yeah, you're so about. it's easy to get a shaded view, slated uh, view of of parents. Uh, it's of the foster care system itself. And especially when you think what's best for the child is not reunification. And the, the state, the CASA workers, that a lot of them go, go against you and say, hey, this is what's in the best interest of the child. So we're removing the child from your home and they're being reunited, right? Well, those are some heavy prayers to Christ yes. to say, God, we, we, we trust in you, right? Uh, because he obviously knows the, the past, the current and the future. Right, and so to me, that's the way you get closer to Jesus. Probably Jan and I's really intimate time with Christ. A lot of times is when we're fixing to uh, say "see you later" for a child, uh, because that might be the last time we see the child, like ever. Uh, we hope to to follow him on Facebook or we have that relationship, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, so to me, the way to get closer to, to, to Christ is, is especially in the prayer life of just trusting him through the process. Oh, and it goes back to the, the great need. But, you know, we uh, three or four weeks ago, we drove to a uh, CPS office in, was it Plano, Dallas, somewhere? It was, there was traffic. Uh, we drove to the CPS office because the, the, our, our baby that had been with us since she was four days old was uh, being moved to a, a, a person that was related to her. The person who was related to her did not want us to drop her off because she said, I don't think I could take her from your arms. And I was like, well, that's good news because I don't think I could let her go. Like, it's a, it, you know, Casey on the other hand said, I really wanted to go to her house. We didn't get to do that. We went to the CPS office. We go to the CPS office, and I'm telling you all, it is the, the amount of traffic going in and out of that office and the amount of kids that are in these situations and then going and they give you a they come in a uh, usually come in a car seat and going and returning that car seat and just seeing stacks of these car seats in there uh, and, and seeing all that and then turning around and and putting putting kissing her for the last time and putting her in a minivan with the CPS worker who's doing the absolute best that, that she can but she's going to drive her over to a, a new house I can't tell you I, I think it's harder I think it's much harder for my wife. I can tell you how hard that is for myself. And so all you got is the Lord. Y'all know that. Like, if y'all ain't lost anybody in your life, you're going you're gonna to find that out when you lose somebody close to you, that all you got is the Lord. And I don't, know how people, I don't know how people make it to Walmart without the Lord, but I certainly don't know how you make it through something like that without the Lord. It will drive you to Jesus like yeah, nothing else. I think we talked about this when we met. Uh, it's almost easier for someone to pass away than to say goodbye to a child. It is. Um, it's hard to say, but it, it's just reality because the child's still living, right? Like we know it's one that passed away, they have a relationship with Christ. Uh, there, there's better options, right? There's, you know, eternal with, 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 with Christ and God, but with the, the child, you don't know what their future holds. And that just brings you back to trusting in God. And you just think stuff like, I just go get in the car and drive over there, yeah. wherever. I mean, it's just, and so the Lord, the, the Spirit has to speak to you. The, only Jesus, only Jesus. So there's no way. We, we have, um, uh, Theron was in uh, California fighting wildfires like uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he, as he said, he's a, he's a fireman. He also used to be a medic in a, the uh, flight medic or whatever, so he'd send me pictures of stuff from the sky. And sometimes he repels from the ceiling at where the Allen, Allen Americans plays. He does all kinds of cool stuff. I don't do anything cool, um, but we listen to the same podcast. So that's, that's, a, that's a thing that we hold together. One of the things that we, we have a, a, a share and admiration for Navy SEALs. Um, and so I like the idea of Navy SEALs, like the idea of the military. I just have a strong respect for that because I like the idea of what could I do if I were pushed to the limits? What could I do? I think that's something that maybe a lot of men think about. What, what, or at my age, what could I have done if I'd pushed myself to these limits? And, uh, and so the SEALs, you know, I'm looking at the Navy SEALs. I'm like, foster parenting feels a little bit like the Navy SEALs of family life 
because you realize, you find out, not that we're that good at it, don't get me wrong on that, but you find out what you're capable of if you're pushed to a limit that you did not think you could get pushed to, and that's pretty cool. But what you find out there is the only way you can be there is by the grace of God and the Lord Jesus right there with you, uh, hanging on to the hem of the garment with everything that you can. So definitely get you closer to Jesus. Seven ways to help. Y'all ready? Everybody's writing all these down. Um, The first way to help is take a look around and see how the Lord would have you to help in an informal way. An informal way. You don't go to any sort of trainings. You don't get involved in CPS. You don't... There are, for the 30,000 kids that are named in the, in the foster care system, I don't know how many kids there are out there that need help. And many of you are, are doing this in, in different capacities. Um, I've got a friend who the circumstances of life uh, just put this kid where he was without any help, and he just moved him into his house. He wound up having some really, really hard health problems. The kid had a lot of health problems and he has worked through. He's just taking him in as his own son. CPS don't know about it. Uh, Nobody, you don't know about it. He don't toot his horn about it. That's just the circumstances of life put him in his life. And so there he is. Um, I was talking with uh, the Nelsons. Uh, uh, Chrissy was up here singing a minute ago. I didn't even ask her if I could do this in the first service either, but she didn't slap me after that, so here we go again. Um, I was talking with her and Steve just about small groups and stuff, and, and they have some. They run some businesses, and we were talking about different, geographically how that works out, and um, they told me that, um, that about, man, the people that we've hired and the, some of the circumstances that they come from, and they began to talk about this young man who was 16 years old that they found out was sleeping in, in the restaurant. And so they could have said, well, you're sleeping in the restaurant. You're out of here, you know, and don't come back or whatever. They didn't do that. They started working with him and helping him. And I said, how old is he now? And Steve's face kind of lit up. He's like, I guess Patrick, I mean, he's a, he's a person to him. He's not a problem to be solved. He's a person to him. He goes, he's about 30 years old now. You know what they were doing? They're fostering this, this young man. They sought out the cause of him that they did not know. And they said, we're going to help him in the capacities that, that we can help. Take a look around and just lift up your eyes and start looking and saying, who here might be without what they need as a kid? And you might be surprised how your ministry could be right there around you somewhere. Is that good? That's good. So that's, that's one, help in an informal way. Oh, I'm going to tell you one more on this. Casey and I were talking about how we got started in this. What was the origin of this? And um, it went back to when I was a student minister. And I would say to anybody who's involved in student ministry, or kids ministry, you need to think about the role that you're playing as an, not, not the parent, but an extension of parenting in a spiritual way. Uh, that is helping to raise them for the glory of God and their good. You're already in it. You, you may, it may not be in a formal way, but you are in it for the glory of God and their good. When I was a student pastor, we had a young lady that the circumstances of her life were uh, really rough. Casey and her were really close. Alcoholism was running crazy. We went to the house of, of the girl and I said, Mr blank. I'm going to take her with us and she's going to stay with us for a while. Dude was lit, you know, so much. He was just like, oh, okay. And so this girl moves into our home. I think she was about 15 at the time. And Casey, so I was about 26 or 27. Casey's three years younger than me. So let's say Casey's 24 years old. And all of a sudden she's 24 year old, 24 years old parenting a teenager. And she's making lunches for the high school kid to go. And I remember like handing out lunch money to this girl. And I'm like 27 years old. And we were talking about the other day because we were the youngest parents of teenagers in the community. And now we're going to be the oldest parents of teenagers in the community. It's just the way that it is. But a lot of that stuff, nobody ever even knew about. No, nobody knew that. And it doesn't have to be a thing that everybody knows about. When circumstances are really hard, you don't put it all over social media and go, hey, guess what? I'm caring for somebody. Their life's really hard. You just don't do that. Y'all, many of you, you know who you are. You're serving in an informal capacity. Oh, okay, I got to keep going. Seven ways to help. Look around. Become a licensed foster care parent. What do they do? Yeah, so... Um... So now then the, the state's kind of changed some regulations where they don't do foster care straight out of DFPS or CPS. So you have to find a agency, right? So uh, Roy and I and our families use Covenant Kids. 
but there's other agencies out there as well, right? But they have to follow some regulations to, uh, in pre-service training. Uh, the pre-service training uh, tells you the, the ins and outs of the legal system of being a foster parent, of what you can and can't do. We're, we are held to a higher standard than the traditional parent that's losing their kid, right? Which is fair to say uh, on that. But it also talks about like uh, how to discipline a child. Uh, obviously, we can we can uh, have physical contact with a child for discipline purposes. A lot of times, it's uh, time time in versus time out, right? So just spending quality time with a child. Once again, it's, it goes back to love. If you love a child, they can change the way they are, right? Uh, and so you do uh, probably about six to eight months of training. Uh, that was pre pre COVID. Now that everything's online. Not not downplaying online training, but maybe a little bit easier than it was before COVID itself. It's a lot easier. Uh, so that's the, the the foster. If you want to be the adoptive parent, uh, there's additional training that you would have to do on that uh, as well. It's okay though. Like it's to to love love these children, short term, long term. Uh, so really love on them. Uh, after that, you do a home study. Uh, so they, they have a home study rider that comes into your house. You open your house up. Uh, they're going to be there four to six hours more than likely. Uh, they're going to talk about your finances. They're going to talk about your, your relationships, uh, how, how you were raised, how your relationship is with your spouse, how your relationship is with your kid. They want to get to know you because it's a family decision, right, uh, as they, they place these children in there. At that point, uh, they will say, hey, these these this family's squared away to be a foster parent, right? And so the agency writes a, a license to foster, right? Then you get to deal with a, about a three-page document of what you will and won't accept uh, for, for kids, right? And that's, uh, we accept a male, we accept a female, we accept... A white kid, we accept a Hispanic kid. We, we accept sexually assaulted, we accept drug abuse, uh, because they, they want it to fit your family, right? And, and as, as biological your children as well. Oh, uh, uh, blocking it. I'm a small guy. Sorry, it was blocking that. Uh, so you 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 pick kind of what's best for your family. I'm right? glad you said that because some people are foggy on that and they think that you're just going to get issued something that you you know doesn't fit your season of life or whatever or age difference. You can you can say no to whatever you want to and you can say a lot of that stuff up front, you're going to have to, you're going to have to make that, and if you're like me, you don't want to do that, no, we'll take anything and everything and everybody, but the ages of, that match up with your kids, if you don't want to have, if you've thought, man, it might be hard to have twins that age, well, you better think about that, because, you know, it can, you can have one the same age as your uh, kids, and it might be, I'm not saying you should do this, but it, in our instance, we said, let's take, let's take in kids that are younger than our kids so that they can minister toward them, and they can feel like they're the big boy and big sister in the house, and that's been, that's been helpful toward us. Yeah, totally. So, like, uh, the, the state law says anyone that you – know, a kid can stay in a, the same room as your bio kid as long as there's no difference in five years, greater than five years difference. So your 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 family and your, your house does matter on that aspect. Uh, but after that, then, once you get a, a child uh, in, in place in your house, then you'll get a, a visit one time a month. Most of the time they're scheduled. Uh, and so don't freak out. Like, well, my house is always dirty. It's going to be okay. Uh, you live there, right? So we don't have to keep it uh, – they're not going to come in with a white glove. No. Uh, but they want transparency. Um, at the end of the day, though, the biggest thing is they want parents that love love these kids. And there's some, there's some dumb stuff like, you know, I mean, there's, I shouldn't say that. There's some stuff that's very irritating about the whole thing. But in large part, you know, live your life like you're not afraid people knock on your door and come in. If you're, if, if you're living in secrecy or something, then it's not cool. Don't worry about what your house looks like. But if you've got something going on you don't want people to know about, change that now for the glory of God. And, you know, then, you, you know, foster caring becomes a little bit more feasible. I will say, if you, if you do this, this second thing, becoming a licensed foster care parent, you will be frustrated by the process. If you're not, then come talk to me because I want to learn from you. I, I, want, I mean, it is just a very frustrating thing. You will ask the question, do they not want me to do this? Why do they make it so difficult? All of us kind of ask that question. You have to remember, we're not doing this for them. Um, I, I mean, like uh, Darren said, we did. The, we started training pre-COVID. So when COVID started and the government was telling me to do stuff that I didn't necessarily agree with, I was like, oh, this is like fostering. Like I'd been already been on a long ramp of that. You know, it's just like, okay, yeah, this is kind of what we have to do for to be able to do what it is that we want to do. We have to make some sacrifices, and part of that is not being so efficient. I don't know if I've said this in this service or not, but I've, we, a lot of us, have a God of efficiency. And so CPS and, and foster care is not the line at Chick-fil-A. It will not work really smoothly. It will not work really fast. You won't be like, ha, 
dang, this sandwich tastes even better than it was so efficient. It's not going to work that way. It's going to be clunky. It's going to be hard. And so, but it's okay. It's worth it. it the need is there. I, I may, I may have said this already, but I want to make sure it, it's clear that uh, it used to be the regulations would allow a, a foster child to go have sleepovers at their friend's house. They could have trampolines. That's, we don't want to identify kids that are placed in, in child's or into homes as foster kids anymore. Oh, they're, they're children. They're children of God. They're your family. And so uh, when, when we're out and about, uh, you know, and I may have uh, a kid with a different skin color than me, but that's still my son or my daughter, right? And that's the way uh, the state wants us to look at it. And I'm pretty sure that's the way God would want us to look at it is that's his child and that, that we just have a, a short-term placement uh, that God's gave, given us the opportunity of that. Yesterday evening, we were the only kid, we were the only people, in the, me and my uh, four-year-old were the only, he's Hispanic, we are the only one in the, in the toy aisle, just us over there. And so I'm facing this way, and he's back behind me looking at something over here, and this lady and her kids are coming through, and she's like, does he belong to you? And I was like, yep, we just don't look alike. And then she had like a 14-year-old boy with her, and he was like, ha, 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 like pointing at his mom. He thought she got busted. But you just get used to that, you know. It's just that people are, people, you know, see that a little bit different. Um, so uh, if you want to do this process, engage in it. The other way, if you... Same thing for the, the um, third thing would be to become a, oh, I was going to say this, funding. So a lot, I want to kind of take the air out of the balloon on this one. A lot of people say they, they get into foster care for the money or it's going to break you. It, neither one of those things necessarily have to be true. Um, for standard care for a foster child, you get $21 a day. So if somebody's getting rich on $21 a day, I want to talk to you too, all right? I want to see your Dave Ramsey on steroids uh, plan. So we... Um, we started this in 2019. Standard care was $21, $21 a day. Now we're here in 2024. It's the same amount that it was. Everything's doubled in price, but that has not. It's, it stays the same. Here's what I want you to know. You need, like Darren said, they're going to come and they're going to ask you about your finances. You need to be able to take care of this kid on your own. That's it. You don't need to. It's, don't, don't get me wrong. It helps. Like, I, like It comes out to about 800 bucks a month, and, and that is helpful. But $21 a day is not making anybody rich, and it's not enough to raise a child. So you need to be able to make... Uh, financial sacrifices. You can't be thinking like, well, I'm not only going to spend $21 a day because this is what they give me. That's not it. You're just going to just be ready for that. That's part of becoming a, a licensed foster care worker. There's some help, but it is what it is. You pointed out in the last service that if you are in foster care and you decide to adopt, those kids do get in the state of Texas, in state. Yeah, in state tuition is covered. Uh, if, if you're adopted, if you were in foster care and adopted, uh, in state schools, uh, state funded schools, uh, they will get college education. We going to college. Uh, which they try to set a, try to set them up for success if you choose college or trade school, right? The other thing I'd say is um, we got to stop the, this epidemic of 30,000 30, kids in foster care. Uh, statistically speaking, a kid in foster care will repeat the same things over and over again, which means their kids will go in foster care as well. Homelessness is a big deal for those who age out of foster care. It's a, um, it's a lot. There's a lot involved in this. And, y'all, got, I've got a, a, as much of a heart, I believe, as you do for, for the unborn and that life begins at conception, 100%. But we also need to know that life goes beyond the womb and that we have, if, what are, where are these kids supposed to go that we value so much? I know that's a hard thing to hear, but, but some of us, we have to, we, somebody has to say yes. Somebody has to say yes. The second, or the, uh, um, the other aspect of this, if you, if you want to become a, fo a foster care parent, the other thing you can do is become a licensed respite care provider. That means that you can keep kids for over 72, 72 hours. 72 hours or longer. But you got to go through all the same training to become a respite care worker as you do to become a foster care worker. All the same stuff involved in that. And so, but you can keep kids, you know, for three days or whatever that is. It's really helpful. Yeah, so uh, Roy and I, we do not have foster kids right now, right? So we're not asking for this, right? right? Uh, so we, I feel a little bit better about saying this. But sometimes we need a break as foster parents. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a friend that needed, he wanted to take uh, his bio kids to a college graduation without the foster kids, right? Uh, or we just need to take a weekend away from our kids because they took a sacrifice. And so three or more days, a little family vacation without the without the, the foster kids helps. So that's what respite care is. It's there to give us a break. Uh, Jan and I, we use respite, respite care for our anniversary trip. Uh, that was a good time for us uh, just to kind of reunite as well. So, that, and then um, beyond that, so a licensed respite care worker, become a CASA worker. So this is a court-appointed worker for the, uh, for the child, and they play a very important part in, in any, child, any 
child that is put into care, they're supposed to all get a CASA worker. There's not enough out there, same, same thing as everything else, but you got to go through extensive training and then you stay with that kid. They never stay at your house, but you find out what's going on with them. You keep up with everything that's happening with them and then when it comes to court uh, hearings, you have a big say-so in what, what might happen in the trajectory of that child's life. And they've been, they can be helpful on many different fronts, but they're a very important part. And that's some of these, I'm not ready to take kids in my home, but I want to help you become a CASA worker. Yeah, so it's a volunteer organization, right? Uh, and they have a big influence on the judge's decision. Uh, and so my example is we had a, a foster son uh, in, our, in our home, and mom just wasn't getting it together. Dad was, I don't know where, uh, wasn't involved, right? Uh, and so this should have went to termination, and the CASA worker seems to be causing hiccups in it, roadblocks of, oh, hey, I'm going to carry mom here, carry mom there. Well, she, she's from Oklahoma, and the state of Oklahoma, if you test positive for methamphetamines upon birth, you're charged with child endangerment. The state of Texas does not have that charge for, uh, for when you test positive. So uh, our little man uh, was Native American because mom was Native American. And so the CASA worker kept taking mom to these appointments to get a, a roll number. I'm like, she's enabling him. Like, I don't understand why would she do this? Why the CASA worker did that was so our little man could get his roll number so he could get state-funded college in Oklahoma. So she's a child advocate. What's best for the child? It wasn't what's best for mom. She was using mom's roll number so, so Creed could get his roll number to get that. So that's what they're there for. Uh, and so they come to your home. They ask how it's, how it's going. And then at the end of the day, the, the ad litem, the kid's attorney, and the CASA worker have, have a big influence on uh, the judge's decision. We had a CASA worker. Our first CASA worker, her name was Frankie. She was about 20 years older than us. Everybody ought to have somebody in their life named Frankie that's 20 years older than you. She was like, uh, she was kind of like our mom a little bit. I mean, she was there uh, for the child we had in care at the time, but also she was really helpful and very encouraging and just very, very special lady. Become a cost worker, become a babysitter. If you just want to babysit foster kids, you have to have a CPR card and you have to get a background check. And that you can keep them up 72 hours. That's it. That's all you got to do. Yeah, so let, let us know. Like, we're going to have some contact information uh, so we get you registered through our, our agency because these agencies are going to require you to be registered. Uh, but you don't have to go do any additional classes, but you have to have first aid and, and uh, CPR. So Red Cross or American Heart Association with the uh, first aid uh, and a background check. So you get fingerprinted, super easy. Go to the DPS office. Uh, they do the digital fingerprints. Let us know about the agency. We'll make our agency pay for the background check. They, they require it, so why not make them pay for it? Don't be going down there if you got the warrant, though. <laughs> Eliminated most of my family tree. <laughs> Y'all can't help. Um, babysitter, um, be a part of a practical support system. Supplies, listening ear, encouraging words. I have gotten so much of this. We've got people who have become babysitters for us. I was talking to one of them after the, service la uh, after the last service. Uh, you had no idea when you started rocking our babies that you'd be doing it four years later. Um, uh, but just... Like, I would love for us to, to have a, a kind of a waiting list of people or people on standby that, here's the deal, when you bring a kid into your home, it's like you had a kid. So it's like, we, got a, we have a newborn, we have several newborns coming to our home. Uh, last year, y'all, we took in a baby homecoming week in Gunner, Texas. If y'all ain't from Gunner and you don't know, you got to act like you know. It's a big deal, you know. So we get this baby, take the baby in. I took the baby to the pediatrician, and she said, and she knows me and knows us and everything. This is actually what she said. Um, she was, baby was four days old, four pounds. And, I mean, just baby, baby. And she goes, hey, uh, Roy, I know you're a town funny man and everything, um, but don't take this baby to homecoming. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she goes, take the freight elevator out of here. This baby is susceptible to everything that's going around right now. And so it is, I mean, it's just like you had a baby. You just had a baby. And so what do we do when people have a baby? We have, they have a baby shower. You have all this kind of stuff to help everybody out because now obviously the, the physical part of that is uh, for the woman is not there, but everything else, your schedule's turned upside down, everything that happens. And so to have people on standby to say, hey, we're willing to help however we can, if that's baby wipes, diapers, whatever. Yeah, so typically what happens is when there's a removal, we get the phone call saying, hey, will you, will you accept? And we say yes, you know, with that, then we'll be there in 45 minutes to an hour. Well, it's really hard to get everything accomplished in 45 minutes to an hour, right? So it would be nice to be able to have some contacts and say, hey, we're getting a baby. Uh, is there any way you could go get size two diapers real quick and some, maybe some formula, right? We'll pay you back. Yeah. But it just helps because the, the paperwork I signed, I'm pretty sure I put more signatures on that piece of paper or papers than I did for my mortgage. Sure. Uh, yeah. 
Casey one time called me. He's like, hey, I just want to let you know it's on the radar. They say we're on the list. We might. they got to pass by a lot of homes to get to ours because it's a Dallas County baby. We might have a baby sometime. And then, like, the afternoon went by, and I was like, oh, okay. And I called her. I was like, they're in the driveway with the baby. Like, they didn't even give us. So sometimes it don't take, you know, 15 minutes. It's just, it's just the way that it works. Be a, I mean, I, I can't tell you how important it is for anybody and everybody that's given your life to whatever you're giving your life to. And, and y'all, y'all may have things that God already has captured your heart, that that is the pinpoint of what you're doing in your life right now. Don't stop that and doing what, just because, I, because Darren and I are saying this. You do what you're called to do. But you need to hear in what you're doing that what you're doing, you're doing for the glory of God. God sees you, he loves you, and he's with you. I can't tell you how encouraging it is to me to hear that and my wife to hear that and Theron to hear that and Jen to hear that and all the other people in here that do that, that, that are engaged in foster care, to hear that. But it is awesome. So that's a huge way you can do that. The final thing is the most obvious for a Christian. If you're here this morning, and maybe for you this wasn't even on your, your radar. It wasn't for, for us. I mean, not that much until several years ago. Definitely not the capacity that it is. But be a prayer warrior for foster kids and parents. Just make it a part of your daily prayer to, to to pray for those that are engaged in it. I met with a couple after the service last week. They fostered for nine straight years, and they said, we're just in a season where we can't do it now. I said, well, well glory to God. You know, use your experiences that you had to share with other people and, and pray for them. Now, oh, yeah, we always pray. They're locked in. They're, they're doing this. Prayer is so important, and everybody, everybody can do it. Um, I'll tell you a, a movie plug for a movie I haven't seen, but the movie is called Sound of Hope, and it's about a church. Well, tell them what it is. So, yeah, it's a... It takes place in East Texas, like in Louisiana, Texas border there. Uh, these kids are obviously in desperate need of finding homes. And the, uh, they're underprivileged, undereducated, uh, and domestic violence is, is prominent there. Uh, and so DFPS, CPS went to, to this church. And basically, if we're not taking care of the kids, we're just clanging noise, is what the bishop would say. Uh, and so out of 30,000 kids... Uh, in foster care, if every church would take two or three kids, would we need homes uh, in the state of Texas for these kids? Or, or would they be in hotel rooms? Because they, they, we would all have one or two kids in our homes taking care of them, loving on them. Uh, and so that's the uh, Possum Trot. Uh, it, Sound is, of Hope. Sound of Hope, Possum Trot. Uh, that's what it's in reference to, is, is there's a desperate need. They took in 22 kids uh, that their church did. Uh, and that was a desperate need there. And... Um, this is what the Lord's called called us to do is is to take care of the orphans and the widows and and this is true orphans and just remember uh, not trying to guilt y'all into this but we were all orphans at once until we found the heavenly Father. I just can't wait to nickname somebody Possum Trot. That's going to be fun. Uh, Q, would y'all go ahead and come on back up? Uh, I want to tell y'all that uh, you can today you can do this on your phone or you can, if you're like me and you don't like messing with stuff like that you can go to connect central and they will help you do this and you can uh on the events so on our website there's a tab for events and then fam or foster adoption ministry you can go and sign up there and you can i would love to see a whole lot of people just put in there i don't know how to help but i'd like to and we are not going to issue you a child at that point or anything like that but we would love to have just a catalog of people that maybe the lord has moved in your heart a little bit and who knows maybe we can get a follow-up meeting and do some q a and see how collectively we might have our own ministry as a church that's a li- just a little bit more structured than what we have to be ready for these kinds of things so sign up on the website or sign up at connect central after the service check out the movie i did watch the trailer for the movie and i started crying so i'm like probably don't need to watch it again you know i'll I'll get to it at some point but it's definitely seemed like it's a it's definitely a help for those kinds of things as well would y'all stand up please and let's be thankful to the lord together in prayer father in heaven uh we were all orphaned and you are our great and mighty and awesome heavenly father I pray that you would help us to be uh, responsible with what you've given to us as your children. In Jesus' name, amen.